Right, um, Yoma from Canberra, the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people. My name is Bryce Wakefield and I am the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Recording in progress. Well, um, after what has seemed to be a relationship that has over the years progressed, sometimes perhaps in fits and starts, the Australia-Japan relationship has blossomed of late. Perhaps one of the more visible aspects of the emerging bilateral cooperation is the defense and security relationship. After a long period of negotiation, Australia and Japan signed a reciprocal access agreement in January 6 this year. This agreement largely clarifies the respective legal obligations of each state when receiving the armed forces of each other, but it nevertheless lays the foundation for further cooperative activities and, according to the governments of the two countries, an enhanced contribution by Japan and Australia to the peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region. It also comes in the context of what Australians frequently cite as um, more forward-leaning um, military activity on the part of Japan. Of course, one area for advanced cooperation is in the maritime sphere, a very important sphere for both countries. And we have two seasoned professionals to discuss bilateral cooperation in this area, as well as general security issues. In the interests of time, I won't list their full bios, but you can find them on the events page. And I'll also put them in the, uh, in the, in the YouTube, uh, uh, detail section. First up, we'll have Admiral uh, Murakawa Yutaka, and he is the 30, or was the 33rd Chief of Staff of the Maritime Self-Defense Forces in Japan. Then we'll hear from Vice Admiral, Vice Admiral Timothy Barrett, who um, is the former Chief of the Australian Navy. They'll be joined in discussion by uh, Dr. Tosh Minohara, who is um, a prof professor at Kobe University and also the president of the Research Institute for Indo-Pacific <laughs> Affairs, or REPA. And um, from, to give an Australian perspective, we'll also hear from Dr. Lauren Richardson, who is a lecturer at the Coral Bell School at the ANU, the Australian National University. I want to give a vote of thanks to our um, supporters and co-organizers in uh, this event today. Um, the event is co-organized um, by the AIA and the Japan Foundation Sydney, so thank you very much to uh, Mr. Sean Okeji and others in his office for the support that re we've received from them. Um, we um, really enjoy the cooperation with, um, with the Research Institute for Indo-Pacific Affairs. And this event is also supported by the Embassy of Japan in Australia. And to say a few words uh, from the Embassy, we have um, uh, with us an, indis, an embassy representative, uh, Mr. Mori Taratsu. Um, so we'll let him have a few words to begin with. Mr. Mori, can you please take it away? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Bruce. And uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start my opening remarks by thanking the Australian Institute of International Affairs uh, together with the Japan Foundation and the Research Institute for Indo-Pacific Affairs for hosting this particularly timely webinar on the future of maritime security in the region and how this impacts on the Japan-Australia relationship. Uh, I should add that this is a topic of great interest to both Ambassador Yamagami and myself. And uh, through the course of discussion today, I'm sure that many uh, that the many esteemed speakers we have today will give their keen insights into what Japan and Australia can do at sea uh, to ensure a free and open in the Pacific region. Uh, with the signing of the reciprocal access agreement between Japan and Australia in January this year, uh, we truly entered a new phase in our security relationship and in what would have been almost unimaginable a few generations ago, 
uh, Japan and Australia have taken a special sp strategic partnership to a greater level of cooperation and involvement between our defense forces across ever-expanding fields of endeavor. This development is a testament to the dedication of both sides to drive the defense relationship forward, and we owe a debt of gratitude to, to those people, including those among our speakers today, who took the initiative to bring our services closer together. Since the initial joint declaration on security cooperation announced in 2007, we have steadily increased our joint exercises and training at sea through initiatives such as Exercise Nichigo Trident and improved our operability through joint maritime patrols with like-minded partners such as the United States, India, European countries, among many others. With the international security environment growing ever more severe now, and with increased challenges bring made, uh, being made to the rule of law and freedom of navigation, now is an opportune time for us to discuss how we can advance our maritime cooperation to ensure a peaceful and secure in the Pacific region. I therefore wish all the speakers today uh, the very best for the uh, event, and uh, I look forward to the discussions to follow. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mori. Now, next up, we have uh, the first of our admirals. Um, it is Admiral uh, Murakawa Yutaka. Uh, take it away, please, Admiral. Thank you very much. I am Yutaka Murakawa, retired Admiral, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. It gives me a great pleasure to be able to talk to you today about the future direction of security cooperation between Japan and Australia, two key partners in the Indo-Pacific. First off, I am elated to meet my longtime friend and former business associate, Vice Admiral Barrett. It's been some time since last time. Therefore, I was very much looking forward to today. In the past, I visited Australia on my first official overseas trip in January, 2017. Immediately after I assumed the position of Chief of Staff of the JMSDF, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. My counterpart at that time was Vice Admiral Barrett, Chief of Australian Navy. Since the 2017 Japan-Australia Joint Declaration on Security Cooperation, security cooperation between the two countries has been strengthened. And during my tenure as Chief of the JMSDF, our mutual cooperation has become much more proactive. In July 2018, Vice Admiral Barrett was replaced by Vice Admiral Noonan. Thanks, we, I was able to continue developing the strong bilateral relationship between the two navies, thanks to the excellent leadership by both admirals. Numerous bilateral and multilateral exercises are con conducted annually, and as a result, the relationship between the JMSDF and the Australian Navy has become very deep. Even during the pandemic, joint training exercises have continued. It is clear that the world's strategic center of gravity is now scary in the Indo-Pacific region. This region possesses not only a large population, but many countries in this region wield enormous economic and military weight. In addition, many territorial and other unification issues have not been resolved. China and Russia are trying to revise the existing rules-based international order, as clearly witnessed by the situation in Ukraine. And North Korea continues to refine 
its nuclear weapons capability, as witnessed by the flurry of recent missile tests. Therefore, we both reside in a region where many major security risks, risks exist. It is only recently that European countries have tilted their interest more toward Chinese hegemonic behavior and as a consequence. Last year, we witnessed several European maritime nations dispatch their, their worship to the Indo-Pacific region. With this as a backdrop, I'd like to begin my talk by giving a brief overview of the current status and history of Japan-Australia security cooperation. After which, I will share my personal views on the future outlook of Japan-Australia maritime cooperation. Let me launch into the history of security cooperation between Japan and Australia. Since 2010, our countries have concluded agreements such as the Acquisition and Cross Servicing Agreement, AXA, the Information Protection Agreement, as well as the Defense Equipment and Technology Transfer Agreement. If you observe the status of the conclusion of security related agreements, you can easily see that Australia is the second closest country to Japan after the United States, the only nation in which Japan has a former military alliance. In November of last year, on the occasion of the joint exercise, Japan-Australia Trident, it became possible to apply JSDF law, Article 95.2, to protect Australian naval vessels. This was the first application towards assets other than those of the US. It was an epoch-making moment as it allowed self-defense force to protect Australian assets. On January 6, this year, at the Japan-Australia summit, both leaders signed the Reciprocal Access Agreement, which had been a long-standing goal by both governments. This agreement simplifies or exempt procedure regarding personnel movement and transportation of weapons and ammunition, ammunition during joint training exercise. I firmly believe that these bilateral exercises between Japan and Australia were trilateral exercises between Japan, Australia, and the US will continue to grow and become more active. In this way, since the 2000s, security cooperation and free rebel interaction between Japan and Australia have expanded greatly. However, I feel that, you, that until the mid 2010s, our cooperation didn't really have in mind the contingency situation. Rather, our cooperation at the early stage focused more on facilitating existing peacekeeping operations, HADR, defense technology, as well as enhancing interoperability to provide indirect support to the United States, a common ally in the Indo-Pacific region. Initially, the Australian government promoted stronger ties with China while Japan had a tense relationship with China over the East China Sea, particularly the Senkaku. As a result, there were certainly many people who worried that strengthening the security relationship with Japan would become a, a hindrance to the Australian government's policy and perhaps even drag Australia into a conflict situation between Japan and China. However, it goes without saying that the biggest factor that changed this foreign policy stance was China's aggressive diplomatic posture known as 
wolf warrior diplomacy and its rapid military buildup that lacked transparency. Compared to when I visited Australia in January 2017, I feel that Australia's view of China has changed dramatically since then. There were re reports also in Japan that an Australian congressman who had spoken out in support of China's actions in, South, in the South China Sea and had uh, received large sums of money from Chinese business person. Furthermore, important facilities such as Darwin Port used by both the Australian Navy and US military were at risk of be being acquired by Chinese capital. I recall that I asked ba Admiral Barrett about the situation of the port since a JMSDF ship was planning a port call to Darwin. The Australian Foreign Policy White Paper published in November 2017 raised concerns about China's activities in the South China Sea. And since then, Australian Navy has increased the number of exercises in the South China Sea. Also, President Trump, who was elected in 2016, viewed China and Russia as revisionist powers, and thus his admi administration took a stronger stance of strategic competition with these two countries. From Japan's point of view, the situation in the South China Sea could be seen as that of East China Sea tomorrow. In the waters around Japan, the Chinese military has become increasingly active in both sea and air, and also not only in the water around the Senkaku. There has been a large increase in the passage of Chinese ships and aircraft between Okinawa and Miyakojima. Chinese power, Chinese power projection capability beyond, and beyond the so-called first iron chain into the second iron chain, which is a crucial line for Australia, has now become a reality. In addition, North Korea launched a series of ballistic missiles with the capability to reach the US mainland during time. For six months from around July 2017, the Korean Peninsula was in a very tense situation. I personally felt that war was imminent. In this way, I feel the area of common interest in national security of Japan and Australia have rapidly expanded while also becoming more concrete in nature. Next, I would like to share my views on Japan-Australia security cooperation in the post-COVID era. When I met Admiral Barrett five years ago, Many people believed that China would eventually match the, in the, in the United States economically and militarily. At that time, our view was that China should contribute to regional stability and fulfill its responsibilities as a major power by acting in accordance with the rule of law. Unfortunately, this expectation was ne uh, never realized under President Xi Jinping's slogan of reviving a great China, China is instead increasing its actions that directly challenge the existing rule-based order by attempting to alter the status quo based on its own claims that are not supported by international law. Since the world was in state of turmoil due to the pandemic. China's vaccine diploma diplomacy and wolf warrior diplomacy drew immense criticism from the free world. As a result, 
the EU announced its Indo-Pacific strategy to discourage China's maritime expansion and to strengthen relations with Taiwan. AUKUS, the new Indo-Pacific security framework of the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia also has, has been launched. The Quad, comprised of Japan and the United States, Australia, and India, also held its first face-to-face -face summit. Looking back in history, we can see that Japan-Australia relations have come a long way. About 120 years ago, Britain, the largest maritime nation, allied with Japan, broke the southward expansion, the Russian Empire, the largest continental nation and hegemon. Considering the current dynamics in, in, in the Indo-Pacific region, it seems inevitable that between the United States, the largest maritime nation, and other de democratic maritime nations will eventually converge their resources to counter China, a hegemonic nation seeking to advance its sphere of influence towards the sea. Japan and Australia will be at the center of this movement in the Indo-Pacific. I believe that the reciprocal access agreement signed in January has groundbreaking implications for the future of the Japan Self-Defense Force and the Australian military. The two countries have now enhanced interoperability through joint exercises. And I feel that we should use this agreement to make more inroads in the area of interchangeability. For example, it's conceivable that we could share roles with the US included from everything from peacetime surveillance to contingency operation and conduct high-end joint operations, including logistics. Those efforts could also set the precedent for deepening relations with European nations, such as the United Kingdom and the EU, who are increasingly interested in the Indo-Pacific. At present, the situation surrounding Taiwan is extremely difficult, and many experts predict that China is likely to invade Taiwan in the near future. And the likelihood of this will increase if Russia is successful in this invasion. We must not forget that China has a strong will to unify Taiwan and is developing the capabilities to do so. When it comes to deterrence, I believe it is important to get more countries involved and to make the other nations understand the magnitude of the cost if a conflict was to erupt. A newspaper article titled, JMSDF vessels conduct freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea several times last year, was published in the Yomiuri on January 11th. As this was not official announcement by the JMSDF, but if it's true, but if this is true, uh, maybe I think this is true. I hope it was done in close cooperation with both the US and Australian navies who conduct similar operations by sharing information appropriately and effectively. Finally, I would like to show the outline of speech given by Australian Defense Minister Dutton at the National Press Club last November. By the end of this year, the government of Japan plans to review its security policy, including the national security strategy. Many of Dutton's ideas can be applied to Japan. First of all, I believe that a strong sense of trust will not be created 
unless Japan strengthens its own defense capabilities so that it can be self-reliant, while also being able to provide robust cooperation with its partner countries. It goes without saying that Japan and Australia will cooperate with the United States, which is an ally both countries. But in addition, it will be necessary to cooperate with countries that share key common values, such as rule of law and freedom of the sea. I have one more thing to add. Cooperation will be needed to emerge victorious in the, in the ongoing competition between democracy and autocracy. There are many developing countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including Southeast Asia and Pacific Island countries. For these countries, there is no question that substantial investment by China leads to strong financial backing, even if it does carry a risk. From this perspective, it is difficult to bring them to our side by simply condemning China's aggressive behavior and human rights violation in defiance of the existing rule-based order. What we need to do is to work together to provide an abundance of attractive development opportunity. In addition to further economic support by both countries, I believe the Australian military and Japan self-defense force should provide their expertise in disaster relief and knowledge in military education, as well as human resources support. Lastly, I would like to conclude my talk today by sharing my vision for the future in which Japan and Australia will share a bond forged by mutual trust, and that this bilateral relationship will serve as a foundation that will contribute to regional peace and stability. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, Admiral. Now, I forgot to mention at the, at the start of the uh, webinar that, of course, um, we um, will be taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please do um, uh, please do just pop it in the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen, or you know, you click on the Q&A function. Um, and we're also doing upvoting. So if you see a question you like, please uh, click on the uh, thumb and uh, the, the, uh, the questions with the most thumbs up will rise to the top. It's also great to see so many of you here. Um, I see lots of people from the AAAA, uh, a few of our fellows actually, some journalists, some people that we've worked with before um, who have who've been on our, our, our events. I see lots of names from Japan, um, one or two friends from the US as well and New Zealand. It's fantastic to see so many of you. Um, next up, we'll have uh, Vice Admiral Timothy Barrett. Tim, can you take it away, please? Uh, thank you. And uh, firstly, let me thank you for the opportunity to present to this forum. And I would like to thank Admiral Murakawa for what has been a comprehensive analysis. Uh, I promise to supplement, but not to duplicate what he has said. Um, we have known each other for a long time. It's great to renew our friendship, um, but we share many views uh, and agree on many matters. So I do not need to, as I said, replicate a lot of what he has said. It does indeed show that there is a strong relationship between our two navies. Uh, it is getting stronger, and I can confirm his analysis of the changes that have faced, particularly over the last 15 years. To highlight that, I would like to just make an observation to start. And that is, as a, uh, a less senior member of our Navy, I represented defense at the Tokyo Defense Forum in 2007, 15 years ago. There were many views that were represented by participants from within the region, but one thing stuck in my mind, 
and that is every map and every chart that was presented to discuss the region stopped at the Indonesian archipelago. Not one chart showed Australia in any of the uh, displays and discussions that were had. Uh, that struck me as unusual for two reasons. One, a perception in the region of what and who Australia was, but also our own view and our own uh, strengths of our position in the region to show that we felt there was a meaningful purpose for our own policy in the region. And it has stuck with me ever since. It's highlighted one thing that I will concentrate my remarks on today, and that is our own view of ourselves in the region and what does need to be considered, debated, and how it will affect how the changes that Admiral Morikawa has uh, uh, enunciated, the changes that have happened over the last 15 years, how they will be supported and how they must endure. So let me just put some context, an Australian perspective around the significance of why this framework that has been developed over these years is so important to us. Australia is a maritime nation. Uh, we sing about it in our national anthem. We are girt by sea. Uh, we're responsible for about 10% of the world's surface in terms of security forces agreements and search and rescue. We are a trading nation, and most of our trading partners are all the north of us in the region. Our dependency on trade by sea is about 9%. 98% of our communications is not done through satellite, but by undersea cable. A very small civil fleet, it's more, uh, which manages this contract. We have issues with uh, national resilience and some critical factors, such as uh, fuel pharmaceuticals uh, and fertilizers and things that are needed to sustain the prosperity of, of this nation. Yet we don't have a maritime vision per se. We have no single minister or department that is responsible for coordinating all efforts. We have a cluster such as Norway would have, noting that Norway uh, draws about 6.7% of its GDP through its maritime trade, not as an enabler, but as a direct contributor to its, its prosperity. Jones Act, as they would in the economic needs, national security needs. We have no ideological basis such that China has in trying to remove a dependency on overseas carriers for our trade. This in mind, a point to what our Navy is. It's smaller than the New South Wales Police Force, if you take it by numbers of people who engage, yet we have global responsibilities. It is technically sound and it is in its workforce. It is a trusted maritime success. Tim, Tim um, sorry, you're, you're breaking up quite a bit. Um, could you just sort of play with your microphone a little bit? I will and I might just remove my no, that's, that's good now. video. How's that? Okay, that's fantastic. Yep. It's only been in the last 15 years or so that success white papers have recognized the maritime strategy and cemented it and a regional focus, which was recently reaffirmed in a defense update of 2020, uh, which uh, the changing geopolitical circumstances that Admiral Mukha has, uh, has pointed out and accelerate our responses to these issues. As a consequence, we see defense spending rising about 1.5% of our GDP to currently 2.1% with a prospect to raise in the near future. There's an ambitious plan to regenerate our fleet and to build a sovereign manufacturing capability with it. It won't grow the fleet size, but it will exploit new technologies in cyber, artificial intelligence, hypersonics, and as has been uh, clearly uh, an unexpected in the press, nuclear propulsion for submarines. But we come from a low base. If I, if I refer to my recent visits to Japan, look at the capabilities, particularly in shipbuilding that, that are existent in a visit in 2017, in 2019, 
uh, there is a stark difference between how we will approach our ability to put our capability uh, is to be able to meet our obligations. So there are different circumstances in which we approach this engagement, this diplomatic engagement that has arisen over the last 10 years. It's to go beyond our military strength alone. And this is why there has been uh, so much effort in the last 15 years to develop and design and generate actions to demonstrate that there is a strategic, a special strategic relationship between Japan and Australia. We've all heard the questions of security cooperation and crossing agreements, the security agreements, ending most recently in the signing of the reciprocal access agreement, a quasi alliance between are two nations. It's done at a time of reawakening by both Japan and Australia of our own strategic needs, but with common aspects to them. The strategic competition in the region, particularly from China, concerns over US intent in the region and its enduring presence, but growing confidence each by both Japan and Australia about our requirement or our desire to to be a global citizen and to do more within our region based on our shared values and our understanding of the rule of law. It translated into actions. Initially, I look back on the efforts that were made for HADR, and I think of the time of the of Fukushima uh, disaster that was happening uh, early in my tenure as the Chief of Navy, and the ability quickly to engage with our counterparts in Japan to start help and uh, equipment to be moved rapidly to be able to assist. There has now been a development and an increase in the complexity of the exercises that we do together. Uh, the participation in these have tested the very things that the reciprocal access agreement seeks to produce. Uh, Bushido Guardian uh, was a complex air combat air operation which was conducted in Japan recently with our aircraft based on Japanese soil. Talisman Sabre in Australia is a large-scale amphibious operation that Japan has now joined. These are not small and incidental exercises. This is a demonstration of growing competency and confidence and trust in each other's capabilities. And this has now been expanded to our engagement within the Indian Ocean uh, with Exercise Malabar. Uh, these are all important illustrations of how this has changed. But with all of these things in mind, and the, and the point I would like to leave in my presence here is the framework is in place. Indeed, it's being used as a model for other arrangements that both uh, Japan and Australia will have with other nations, particularly in the European. It is a positive trajectory of further engagement, exchanges, exercises, information sharing, and the ability to manage in our region together uh, greater security cooperation and humanitarian assistance. But here in Australia, to enhance this cooperation, it still requires a greater domestic understanding and an enduring support for the intent of what is trying to achieve here. To understand the cooperation that is needed during crisis and conflict, including those very issues of basing each other's forces in each other's countries. The idea of collective security, trust in partnerships such that this can be uh, maintained. Uh, in the general consequences of what may occur and the risks that may flow if these actions are not pursued through. Indeed, around the world, navies often refer to a thing called sea blindness, a lack of understanding of a nation's maritime needs, but then also how you apply uh, defense and diplomatic means to overcome this, uh, this sea blindness. It is with debates such as this and discussions such as this that we can actually ensure that those elements are well understood, particularly within Australia. So the reason behind 
the dramatic increase in the cooperation and the growing level of uh, friendship and confidence in each other's abilities um, can be harnessed to fully exploit this arrangement. I think I'll leave my remarks at that stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, so much, Vice Admiral. Now, um, uh, we're, we're again, please do put your um, questions in the Q&A if, if you have any. Uh, we've already got some very good questions coming up. Um, but first, we're going to have um, a response uh, from Professor Toshmi Nohara, uh, again, Professor at um, Kobe University and uh, President of the Research Institute for Indo-Pacific Analysis. Tosh, take it away, please. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wakefield, for the kind introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, be able to participate in this uh, really meaningful uh, panel today. So uh, I'd like to uh, give my brief remarks, and these will mostly be questions. Um, Admiral Murakawa in his talk uh, said that uh, the Indo-Pacific is, is the center of the gravity uh, of the world, which this is hard to deny. But in the meantime, it seems that uh, the affairs in Europe have really uh, shifted the gravity at least uh, momentarily. Uh, we have a nation that has a GDP smaller than South Korea wreaking havoc upon another uh, European, smaller European nation. And so, uh, one comes to wonder uh, what would happen if the second largest uh, nation with the second largest GDP were to act uh, militarily, uh, what would the impact be? Uh, and it is also very, uh, I, I'm viewing with caution how uh, China and Russia are realigning their interests and possibly uh, coming into closer orbit, at least uh, from the perspective of the military. Uh, so um, it seems to be that the world is uh, interconnected. And so even though we focus on the Indo-Pacific, we cannot be, uh, can distance ourselves from what is happening in Europe. So, and I've been speaking to uh, many uh, high level Japanese diplomats and also those active in the military. And it seems to be that this, this what's happening in Europe needs to be uh, an opportunity for uh, an awakening. So we will for at least from the Japanese perspective. Uh, countries such as uh, Germany, uh, even the Nordic countries are really uh, changing their views as, as to how they understand uh, international security affairs. So I think Japan uh, needs to be uh, follow in, in, the, in, the, in this pattern. So with that being said, I, from the Australian perspective, Admiral Barrett, if you will, um, what do you believe that Japan, um, I sort of wanna cross the question. So uh, Admiral Maraka can't comment out about the Australian side and, and you can uh, comment on the Japanese mm -hmm. side. Um, you working with the Japanese, what areas do you feel need to, that there's room for improvement? Uh, what can be done further mm -hmm. uh, in light of what's happening uh, in global affairs in where Japan and, and Australia can come together? And I've read in the press that Australia will be increasing its defense budget and I believe that you will be increasing your army as well. Um, I do not hear similar news from the Japan side. So, um, so in your in your uh, past experiences, I'm sure there are always uh, areas in which there can be more improvements. Uh, and also, I'd like to ask you, and this is uh, the both of you. Um, so, my question about um, how uh, both countries can improve um, their cooperation in the maritime sphere. This this question is also to Admiral Boraka. Uh, I was very disappointed, and I hope I'm not alone in this group, uh, of the attitude taken by India in which it, it really uh, defines its national interests in very, very narrow terms. Uh, and so as, uh, Russia is viewed as a, a friend, and therefore uh, India will not take a, a strong position on the issue of Ukraine. Um, as a democracy, as one of the world's largest democracies, um, and we have Quad, we have Malabar exercises, uh, we would think that uh, we shared values with India, and it seems to be uh, that that's not really the case. So um, how do you, this is to the two admirals, do you view the future of Quad? When I look at Quad, I see the United States and Australia being very close. Uh, Japan follows probably uh, maybe one step behind, and then there's India. And so is, is Quad uh, something that's meaningful when it comes to the realm of security? I mean, when it comes to vaccine distribution and, and the in the environment, of course, quad perhaps have some kind of come to use. But other than that, when it comes to the sphere of security, 
uh, what future does Quad have? And what expectations should we have of India? How does the, uh, the calculus change now that we see uh, India pursuing its, its own national interests? An extension of this would be my question to AUKUS. I think AUKUS in a way could be seen as uh, the United States being sort of uh, not having high hopes for Quad and therefore wanted to create a more pure uh, security cooperation. Is there any room for Japan to join the scheme? Um, I am uh, tentatively calling it Jokus, uh, but you know, uh, could this be a, a, a way in which uh, we can move forward? And also concerning what's happening in Europe, um, I think NATO is, uh, should not be just concerned with Europe. Is there any way in which Australia and Japan, I, I believe that, I know that Japan's observer, I believe that Australia is also perhaps has observer status, but how can Australia and Japan work closer with NATO? especially considering that Japan and, and Australia both have a fairly formidable uh, uh, maritime uh, you know, uh, presence. So, um, so these are my uh, basic questions. Um, and perhaps in the end, if you could also share your outlook as to, uh, as to where we're headed from here. Um, I believe that Putin, as a dictator, uh, uh, defeat is not an option for him. He may go all in in which uh, this, this war uh, may not be a, a local and limited war. Looking as a historian, looking back in War I and War II, uh, you had President Wilson and President uh, uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who, were, who really wanted to get the United States involved. And it was the American public opinion that sort of held the United States back. Uh, in today's world, we have a president who is a non-interventionist and probably a secretary of state who is also a very non-interventionist. So you have the, uh, the American leadership that's sort of holding back. But of course, um, with public opinion changing in the United States, uh, this could change. And in what we see as a very limited war uh, could be uh, have more uh, elements of becoming a global war. So with that in mind, uh, how can Japan and, and Australia help out uh, so that we uh, can ensure that democracy and freedom prevail? Mm -hmm. So that's my uh, comment slash uh, questions. And thank you again for the opportunity to participate today. Okay, fantastic. Um, rather than going um, going back to our, our first speakers and getting them, them to answer blow by blow, we'll have a response from Lauren Richardson. And I really appreciate um, Lauren uh, popping in here at the last minute to represent an Australian view. Our, our other Australian um, invitee was unfortunately able to make it, unable to make it today at the last minute. Um, so thanks, Lauren, for that. Um, and I'll try and weave those questions that um, that Tosh gave us into uh, into the Q and A session um, uh, as well as well. I'll try and get the 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 admirals to to answer answer them in turn, but also supplement them with other questions. So please, Lauren, can you take it away? Okay, thanks very much, um, Bryce, for the invitation. And I should stress to the audience that I have just literally come in at the last minute, my morning was taken up by meetings. So I'm just still getting my head around um, today's topic. Um, I really enjoyed the papers and I thought I'd focus my comments, not so much on asking questions, but just providing what I see as some further context to um, the enhanced maritime cooperation we see um, between Australia and Japan in recent years. I think we can obviously understand it um, as part of Prime Minister Abe's legacy. Um, Japan has always faced a bifurcated road. One way is to becoming a land power, one way is to becoming a sea power. And at some point you need to say to the international community, this is who I am, um, this is where we're going. And Prime Minister Abe really did this, um, really in his um, The Alliance of Hope speech, um, when he really affirmed that Japan's national identity is a seafaring maritime state, um, announced, in other words, Japan will be a maritime power. And not every Japanese prime minister wanted to take this path. Um, also, another aspect of Abe's initiative in this regard was the articulating the free and open Indo-Pacific um, concept. Um, this was partly an invitation for Trump to join in, to have greater engagement in the region, but in many ways, Australia responded um, very much to this call. And obviously, as part of Abe's um, objective of establishing Japan as, as a maritime power, um, like-minded maritime democracies became a key phrase that mattered a lot uh, to his administration. And therefore also Australia 
Singapore um, came to matter a lot. Um, so we see with the, the challenges um, that Japan, also the United States, Australia has faced in the, the region, it's become clear to um, the United States that it's, it's really losing its, its military edge um, in relation to China. Japan has also had a dawning realization that the US-Japan alliance is no longer you know, strong enough to deter China's actions. And therefore it became increasingly important um, for Japan um, and also Australia to really strengthen the interspoke relations um, in the, the US security architecture in the region. And I think what has also provided impetus to this is that it's become clear in recent years that the, the kind of Cold War um, US security architecture in the region has really weakened over time and aspects of this architecture have become out of date. Um, if we think back initially to the Cold War, you know, the US objective was to create a trilateral deterrence network between the US, Japan and South Korea. And for a while, this was very effective. But again, with the end of the Cold War era, um, a lot of differences emerged between Japan and South Korea. The two countries are not very aligned in their strategic, um, basically their strategic visions, particularly toward China but also North Korea. You see what times when Japan wants to isolate North Korea, um, South Korea is um, embarking on an engagement um, policy. So the two countries have really diverged in that sense. And what's also extremely worrying is that this trilateral deterrence network was created to, to sort of offset the deterrence network emerging between Russia, um, USSR, North Korea and China during the Cold War. And what's extremely worrying today is that there's almost sort of more strength to that um, trilateral arrangement, arrangement than the US, Japan, South Korea one. Um, so when you look at it from that perspective, the ties between Australia and Japan um, have become extremely um, important. And we've been talking for some time now about the post-COVID era, and we've heard that in today's presentations. And this is because the, the pandemic was really the defining global event of recent times. We've seen a lot of changes in China's behavior during that pandemic. But now, as alluded to by the, the previous discussion, um, we're rapidly moving toward a new era ushered in by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And for a long time, we've conceived of the Indo-Pacific as the main arena in which we anticipate conflict and in which the rules-based order is being undermined with the focus being on China. Um, but as we've heard from the previous discussion, we now see that Europe has become a primary arena um, for these trends. And it's highly likely that the focus of US foreign policy and global security policy will be focused um, on this region for quite some time, particularly if the current conflict expands beyond the scope of Russia and Ukraine into Europe and um, more widely. So the, the new global security environment is a very different security environment to the one in which the reciprocal access agreement was finalized between Australia and Japan. And we can see now that this agreement has taken on a whole new significance. Um, and I think this state of affairs will, will hopefully serve to elevate the importance of um, Australia and Japan, deepening the scope of their bilateral security cooperation and interoperability, and also um, continuing to enhance security cooperation um, with India to fill what could be an even deeper vacuum if the US does end up being quite preoccupied um, in Europe. So I'll leave it there, thanks. All right, thank you, Lauren, and thank you both. Uh, great comments there. Now, um, let me just, I mean, I think the, uh, the the focus of a lot of those comments were of course the current um crisis in ukraine and europe um and what effect that will have on uh security in the indo-pacific um prior to the the crisis we did see um uh a lot of countries in the region i mean europe and indeed the eu itself um develop their strategies for the indo-pacific we saw the dispatch of the um HMS Elizabeth, is it Queen Elizabeth II, uh, the new carrier? Um, we saw the dispatch of the German uh, warship, uh, the the uh, the Bayern. Um, 
a lot of attention being being placed on the Indo-Pacific by European countries, um, perhaps, and perhaps Brexit had something to do with that, you know, competition for attention. Um, are we, Lauren has alluded to the notion that perhaps um, global attention is going to be uh, is going to be focused on a different sphere going forward. Um, it's going to be focused on Europe. Tosh, I think, um, uh, try emphasized um, the fact that uh, the Ukraine crisis underscores how uh, these two spheres are interconnected. Um, I'd like um, your the, the views of the admirals, Admiral uh, Murakawa and Vice Admiral Barrett. I'd like your views on to what what you see as the the emerging shape of geopolitics going forward. I'll start if you're you're happy, uh, Admiral Murakawa. I think uh, uh, we're losing you again. <laughs> okay. How's this? Is this any better? It's better, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think if we look initially to uh, the US pivot to the Indo-Pacific uh, during the Obama administration, uh, there was a sense of dramatic change in, in foreign policy within the US. I think rapidly it was understood that concerns over an emerging Russia remaining within the European theater uh, was still of such strength that there was no uh, overriding commitment to move the pivot to Indo-Pacific. So I, I don't think it's, it has been a binary statement. I think the concern around Russian re-emergence has existed in the minds of certainly the US military for quite some time. Uh, that doesn't mean that the current conflict uh, is a surprise. Uh, but it it does mean that there was always an underlying issue that would limit, to some extent, uh, what was going to occur in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so I think that that has remained. What has been uh, clear in my mind is uh, China is watching what happens in the Ukraine for the obvious similarities uh, in uh, the, the arguments around sovereignty and around the nature of, uh, of how that particular sovereign state is being um, resumed within uh, a former um, USSR construct, if you wish. Um, but what has been surprising, I think, and this in the open press would be suggested, uh, is that the level of uh, response from the West was not as was previously imagined, uh, and there has been strength, and you raised it uh, yourself, Bruce. The issue around uh, uh, European countries, be it Germany, be it the Nordic countries, forming a role, a position that they had not been willing to uh, formulate before or, or state publicly before, um, is something that I would imagine China will be reviewing in terms of the Southeast Asian nations and those existing arrangements that exist for cooperation among them, be it Malaysia, be it Vietnam, uh, be it those, uh, be it Indonesia, those countries that uh, have worked through in the military sense, the ADM plus forum, uh, through ASEAN, uh, through a consensus, um, but now see that uh, those things that had been attempted to be managed through consensus may no longer be possible if there's a growing view within China that it could replicate the actions in Taiwan as Russia is doing in the Ukraine. So I think I, I don't I see it as not a binary solution. I think the the area has always been um, at risk. I think that's the struggle the U.S. military has certainly demonstrated in their discussions and views over over a long period of time. Um, but I do think that uh, we will see change in our region. Uh, and I won't just say necessarily by Australia, Japan, or even South Korea, or smaller nations will, uh, will see a position in existing for whether the, uh, the islands can try to retain stability in the region to date, whether they still hold firm. Okay, 
Great. Um, uh, unless uh, Admiral Murakawa, do you want to say something to that? Yes. Okay. Good. Now we do okay. have a, we do have a an interpreter here if if yes. Uh, yes. Admiral Murakawa needs it. Yep. Yes. I will answer in Japanese. Excuse me. Uh, Thank you. I would like to respond to the comments made by um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Richardson and Dr. Wakefield. Uh, so looking at the current situation in uh, Ukraine, uh, the comments made were that uh, perhaps um, the US uh, perspective or focus uh, may shift towards uh, Europe. And how uh, would uh, the future geopolitical situation change as a result of that? えっと、実は、ウクライナの紛争が始まった以降、え、日本の周辺海域では、ロシアと中国の海軍の動きは大変活発化しています。uh, in fact, uh, since the Ukrainian dispute uh, started, um, the um, Russian and Chinese uh, uh, naval activity uh, in the oceans around Japan has become uh, very much more active. I am お、注意を怠るということはないと信じていますが、より日本やオーストラリアの協力というのが必要になっていくと思います。um, the uh, US Pacific uh, fleet uh, in uh, Hawaii, uh, I would like to believe, uh, would uh, not take the position of uh, take, uh, not, uh, not taking enough notice uh, of uh, what is happening um, in the Pacific uh, as well with Russia and uh, uh, China. But I think it is almost certain uh, that cooperation from Japan uh, and Australia will need to increase. 特にサーベイランスあるいはインフォメーションシェアリングというような部分では緊密な協力が必要になってくると思います。In particular, I believe that a very close cooperation would be required for surveillance and information sharing. もう一つはこれ本当に有事になった場合を考えますと。私の話の中でも申し上げましたが、アメリカと日本とオーストラリアの役割分担をしっかりする必要を考えておく必要があると思います。and another thing I would like to mention uh, is in consideration of a real contingency uh, occurring, and I referred to it during my comments earlier. Um, I believe uh, that uh, uh, the roles that uh, uh, the US, Australia, and Japan needs to play in this context uh, need to be considered thoroughly. え、本当はこれに、え、韓国も加わってもらいたい。いうのが、私の本音です。uh, my real feeling regarding this is that uh, I would really like to see Korea join us in that. あの、ご存知の通り、韓国と日本の関係は非常に厳しいものがありますけれども、え、私は韓国の存在というのは、あ、この地域の安全保障上極めて重要なものと考えています。as you would know, um, the relationship uh, between Korea and uh, Japan is extremely uh, difficult, um, but I believe uh, that the existence of uh, Korea uh, is extremely important for the security of this region. え、地政学的にどうなるかという話ですけども、やはり最大の脅威は中国であることは私は変わらないと思います。
Um, lastly, uh, what would the geopolitical picture look like was the uh, part of the question uh, as well. I think that there would be no major changes at all uh, in the fact that China remains the greatest threat. So, 最後にあの三ノ原先生のご質問にお答えしたいと思います。I would now like to respond to uh, Dr. Minohara's uh, uh, questions. この地域にはクワッドとかオーカス、あるいは日本とオーストラリアはそれぞれアメリカと同盟を結んでいます。多くのフレームワークが存在します。We have uh, uh, numerous frameworks uh, in this region,、uh, including the Quad or AUKUS.、Uh, Japan and Australia, respectively, have, an alliance, have alliances with the US.、えーえー、えー。アピールする力というのは力強いものがあると思いますが安全保障上どこまで強いものかということについては疑問を持っています。My thinking is uh, that uh, uh, Quad has political power or political appeal. I think it certainly has strength in that uh, area. Um, but uh, uh, I question its uh, uh, strength in terms of uh, um, security. Shorai Teki Niwa Ocas Ni Nihon Mokuaru Aruiwa Ano Atarashi. 日米豪あるいはそこに韓国を加えるということになるかもしれませんがそういった、えー、安全保障上の枠組みというのを作る必要もあるのかと思うのですがこれはぜひあのバレット中将にも私はお聞きしたいと思っていたところです。So,、uh, in the future,、um, perhaps Japan could join AUKUS, or there could be a new framework of、uh, Japan, US, and Australia,、uh, with、uh, Korea included as well, perhaps.、Um, I'm thinking that、uh, in that context, a new security frame,、uh, framework is possibly、uh, necessary. And on this point, I would be very interested、uh, in hearing、um, Admiral.、Uh, Barrett's view as well.、Uh, thank you. If, if I may,、uh, particularly with the AUKUS position,、uh, look, I want to note that AUKUS, as it announced, is more than just arrangements and technical agreements for sharing of、uh, nuclear propulsion in、uh, the array of. Capabilities that it uh, evoked uh, are all things that are currently, through other arrangements, being shared or managed uh, with uh, nations such as Japan. You're, bre you're breaking up again, sorry. I, I think it is entirely.、Uh, Possible that those elements、uh, will flow into arrangements、um, in other countries.、Uh, so I think whether AUKUS itself、uh, becomes something larger、um, or whether it's just those sub、uh, authorities within AUKUS are shared, I do see changes to the overall structure of AUKUS over a period of time. Okay, very good.、Um... I think it's, I think it, when you press on your microphone, it improves the sound. So that's probably the solution, hopefully.、Um, very good. I just want to go now to something that,、um, that Admiral Murakawa raised because it's in line with one of the questions、um, uh, in the QA. You, you talked about,、um, uh, you talked about different roles of the,、um, of the different um, navies. Um, Uh, you use the term, I think, Yakuari Buntan, right? So there's a question here from Corey Wallace,、um, who's a friend of mine and,、uh, and an expert on, um, on uh, uh, Japanese uh, security policy. 
he asks the maritime self-defense forces and the Royal Navy, Royal Australian Navy, sorry, both have their areas of niche advanced maritime capabilities. What specific areas of expertise is the MSDF eager to learn more about from the Royal Australian Navy? And I guess we can, we can do that um, uh, in reverse as well. So areas of expertise that the MSTAF could learn from the RAN. Admiral Morikawa. えっと、オーストラリア海軍から学ぶことはただあると思います。あの、1つは、え、戦略的なことをちょっと抜きにしてお話ししたいと思います。um, I believe uh, that there's a great deal to learn uh, from the RAN, uh, but I would like to put aside strategic matters in responding to this question. Uh, え、技術 on the technical uh, and technological aspects, uh, there are many, have many areas that we could carry out cooperation uh, on. Uh, and as Vice Admiral Barrett mentioned, um, there is much uh, that we can uh, exchange uh, um, uh, on for uh, cyber space and other new um, areas. もう一つ、あの、個人的にはオーストラリアが大変少ない人数。の中で、え、軍を維持していくということをやっておられます。え、その点につきましては日本は学ぶところがたくさんあるかと思います。on um, a, a personal uh, front, I would uh, uh, like to mention that I see the uh, Australian uh, military maintaining uh, its military operation with a, a very small number of uh, uh, people. I think Japan has a great deal to learn from that. という um, so in terms of other areas of cooperation, as mentioned uh, before, uh, from uh, now on, it is not just a matter of carrying out uh, joint uh, exercises, uh, but uh, we really have to look at the roles that the respective uh, countries need to play uh, in uh, peacetime, as well as during uh, a contingency um, in order to, uh, to uh, meet uh, the uh, requ requirements of of us contributing to the security of the region. Very good. Um, uh, Vice Admiral Timothy Barrett, do you want to chime in there or? Uh, I will. I'll hold my microphone to make it sound better, hopefully. Uh, look, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I agree with uh, Admiral Murakara. Uh, um, without going into the strategic size, the, the view that Japan now joins uh, the ADF and the US forces as part of Tal Talisman Sabre, uh, for my mind, is more than just executing an amphibious demonstration. Uh, the complexity of such an operation tests a range of uh, military capabilities through aviation, through uh, uh, maritime skills, just through the cooperation and the development of plans to execute complex uh, operations themselves. Uh, I see that continuing and growing, uh, and it should, um, because they are the fundamentals of any form of uh, operation you might be required to perform for government. Uh, but we do have active areas of engagement already. Um, uh, I, I am an aviator uh, as well as a mariner, uh, and I know we have had engagement in the past where we have learned um, everything from training aspects to sustainment aspects from the uh, the maritime self-defense force in how they operate their aviation force uh, we've learned from there there were there was a period clearly and uh, i will raise it where we developed 
uh, a level of interest in preparation for uh, submarine activity. Um, and again, it's about being able to uh, understand, develop and cooperate how submarines are used as part of a wider surveillance organization. Uh, and so there are areas that have been and will be further pursued because they are in the natural course of developing competencies within militaries so that you can successfully work together. So I think there are, uh, there are plenty of opportunities for us to share more uh, and to develop our skills uh, in a joint fashion, which will help the individual nations. Okay, that's fantastic. It looks like we've um, discovered a high tech uh, solution to our, <laughs> um, our microphone problem. So you can probably flick your camera back on now. Uh, to, thank you. Okay, very good. Um, uh, now, at the end of his talk, uh, Admiral Murakawa um, mentioned uh, development and aid. There's a question here. What value do you think aid and development in the Pacific Islands will contribute to regional security? I think we have of course, uh, heard that from Admiral Murakawa, but there's an underlying question to that. What is it that um, Australia and Japanese cooperation um, can add to that? So Murakawa, Admiral Murakawa, yeah. えっと、先ほどの発表の中では申し上げなかったのですが、今年に入りましてから海上自衛隊は初めてパラオとバヌアツと共同訓練を実施しました。I didn't mention this during my presentation, um, but the, uh, the Japanese uh, maritime defense for uh, defense um, actually carried out uh, the first ever joint exercise uh, with the navies of uh, Palau and Vanuatu. え、今まであの、太平洋島諸国との訓練ということは実施しておりませんでしたが、これはあの、これから続けていく必要があると思います。そういったことを通じてオーストラリアもちろんオーストラリアと協力してですけどもオーストラリアや日本の価値観あるいは自由で開かれたインド太平洋というものがなぜ必要かということを彼らと共に考えていかなければいけないと思っています so uh, we hadn't carried out any um, exercises with uh, the Pacific Island nations uh, to date. Um, so this was the first time. Um, and I think that this is something that we uh, must continue into the future. And through uh, such um, uh, cooperation, uh, we need to work with uh, uh, Australia uh, to talk to uh, the Pacific uh, Island nations about uh, different values, sense of values, uh, and why um, uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific is uh, necessary. These are matters that uh, we, um, together with Australia, uh, need to think about along with the Pacific Island nations. Okay, very good. Um, uh, that, um, I guess, raises uh, another question in the, uh, in the, in the, Q and A from Dennis O'Day, um, and um, I mean, do you see such an arrangement? And I guess that means reciprocal access agreement um, expanding or working to or with other regional neighbours. The example here is New Zealand, but you could include um, um, other sorry other regional navies um, or militaries like Fiji, perhaps um, in the longer term. Um, do you have any? any insight into that I'll, I'll ask Tim that if you want to yeah. I, I think the answer is yes to that in simple terms uh, and just reverting to the previous question uh, there's a level of engagement that Australia currently exists in the Pacific uh, that is meaningful in that the Pacific patrol boat project has provided uh, a a purposeful capability that allows uh, uh, those nations to be able to manage their own maritime security, be it fishing, be it uh, um, uh, 
Okay, we're 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 losing you again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying that trying the method. Um, how's that? That's good. Okay. So there, there's an existing long-standing arrangement with the Pacific Patrol Boat Program. Uh, that is something that we already share in uh, cooperation with New Zealand as to how that's approached in the region. So there are existing arrangements that work well. The important thing to note is those programs deliver a purposeful and meaningful outcome for those nations, not just patrol boats, but uh, contracted aerial surveillance, etc. cetera. Um, that, uh, that often is at stark odds with how other nations have sought to uh, enter the, uh, the aid or uh, cooperation uh, field within the Pacific areas. Um, with items that are not necessarily usable once the nation has left the area. Um, so I think there's an example that already exists. It's already something that is shared with New Zealand, um, but I think it is also uh, an opportunity that could be used by other nations from within the region. And as I said earlier, the level of cooperation and demonstration that's already been had between Japan and Australia in terms of some of these exercises are equally applicable in the Pacific region. Okay, very good. Um, I, I, I wonder if that raises the question or the discussion of aid raises the question on uh, whether it's um, how, we, how we kind of um, conceptualize aid in the Pacific region. Um, there's been a lot of discussion of um, aid as a framework to challenge for example, China's uh, dominance in the region. We have, for example, a question here from Vishwas Grover, who asks, could you please also further elucidate about China's recent engagement with the Solomon Islands? Um, could, you, could you perhaps place aid in that framework and, and discuss it for us? Um, but Admiral Murakawa, you seem to be grasping for the mic there. <laughs>今新しいことがあったと私はことというのは私は知りませんただもう数年前から中国が太平洋の島しょ国に対して投資をしたりすることによってですね影響力を強めてきたということは注目していますum, I don't know of anything in particular uh, that is happening, which is new, uh, but um, uh, I uh, do take uh, a close note of the fact that uh, um, China has been uh, investing in the Pacific Island nations from several years ago and uh, um, growing their influence in the region. Tim. You're, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I, I make the distinct point. There's there's a vast difference between um, aid that provides something purposeful and meaningful to a nation's development, and it relies on existing um, uh, foreign affairs understanding of the needs of those particular nations, rather than aid that might be applied short term uh, to meet what is perceived to be a need but does not endure or sustain. Um, and uh, again, I say uh, Australia has gifted now 22 patrol boats to the region uh, for uh, 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 an ability of those nations to be able to manage their own policing function and maritime security functions. It has real purpose. It's delivered with a sustainment package, uh, with training, um, and it lasts over a 15 year period. Uh, aid programs of that nature uh, are more likely to succeed. And it's evident in the fact that this is the second iteration of a program that was successfully launched back in the 80s. Um, it stands, as I said, as a stark difference to how other um, uh, aid programs have been uh, pursued within the region. Okay, very good. Um... I'll, I know we're, we're almost at time now, but I'll take one more question. Um, and then I might turn back to Lauren and Tosh to see if they have anything uh, quickly to, to add in sum. But I want to go to a question from Tom Corbin here. Um, and it's on the differences of in, not so much interpretation, but uh, of, of view 
on um, the role played by the reciprocal access agreement um, in each nation or in both nations. So are there noticeable differences between uh, the way Australia and Japan view this agreement? And Tom's um, putting it particularly in the context of how the RIA fits into Japan and Australia's respective alliance frameworks with the United States. Um, or are there differences in the types of activities that um, that the agreement might facilitate in Australia vis-a-vis -vis Japan? And um, I think Murakawa, uh, Admiral Murakawa started uh, the, the session before, so I think I'll go to Tim first for this one. Vice Admiral Barrett, yeah. Thank you. Uh, in short answer, no, I don't think there are differences from my interpretation of uh, how both nations are uh, uh, implementing it. Uh, both see it as something that supplements an alliance program with the US. But I also think that uh, we we both have a domestic uh, management that has to be put in place, particularly over sensitive issues of basing foreign uh, militaries within our organ within our own country or having them at least um, based there for short periods of time. So I think those those are common issues that we share, but I both feel that uh, it's seen as a supplement to existing alliance arrangements with the US, not as something that uh, is at odds with that. Admiral Murakawa. Uh,私もバレットと従業と意見は一緒です。ただ、あのこのアグリメントはまだこれから運用していく話ですので。その段階でいろいろな問題は出てくるかもしれませんが、ゆくゆくはアメリカともオーストラリアとも同じようにできるというのが理想だと思っています。um, my uh, thinking is basically the same uh, as what uh, uh, Vice Admiral um, uh, Barrett has uh, said, um, but um, this is an agreement that has uh, recently come into uh, place, and it is from now onwards that it will be in operation. And under uh, the operation of the agreement, there could be uh, different issues uh, coming up, uh, but uh, um, uh, the ideal, I believe, uh, is to be able to uh, have a, a framework that is the same for vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US and uh, Australia. Okay, very good. Now, uh, we are right on right on two o'clock now, but I will leave um, what will be effectively the last words to Lauren and Tosh. Lauren, do you have uh, comments on the session that you've um, yeah, I could just wrap up by saying, I mean, it, it's been an excellent discussion. Obviously, one layer of change that we haven't discussed is that Australia will um, have an election soon. Japan has a relatively new um, prime minister and South Korea also has a new president, incoming president, who vows to be more hawkish um, on China. I think regardless of the outcome of the election in Australia, I think the China issue is obviously a a bipartisan issue. Also, the, the importance of the Australia-Japan relationship is, is also a bipartisan issue. We won't see many changes there, but certainly there could be some opportunities um, for Australia to help, I guess, encourage greater security cooperation um, between Japan and South Korea under these new administrations. Very good. Tosh, do you want to... Yes, thank you very much. I would like to echo what uh, Dr. Richardson said. It was an excellent session. I was glad to be able to participate. Uh, there's also elections in the Philippines coming up. Uh, perhaps we won't see any positive change there, but uh, I do believe Philippines is strategically very important as part of the uh, island chain. Um, I think uh, if, had we had more time, I'm sure we'd have discussed Taiwan, but I, I, it's always on my mind. Uh, if something does happen uh, in, in Taiwan, I do believe that, that we need to have preparations in which not only the United States, but Japan and Australia can at least have kind of some kind of basic uh, plan of action and how to respond. Uh, we just don't want to be flat footed. So, um, and I think that is perhaps the, the, the largest concern uh, in the time being in the region. Uh, and perhaps followed by uh, North Korea, uh, see what happens there. Um, so we, uh, seems to be uh, Pax Americana is entering into a, a different phase. 
And uh, w- with the relative decline of American influence, I do believe we are entering into a period where uh, international relations will become a lot more uh, unstable. And to me, I think the analogy is Japan and the earthquakes uh, from 1995, the earthquake in Kobe. Definitely there's been an uptick in the number of occurrences. And I think international relations uh, is similar. Uh, we are no longer in a period of relative stability. So the session in that regard was very, very worthwhile. I do hope that we can do a lot more between Australia and Japan. And thank you again uh, for this opportunity. I hand it back over to you, Dr. Wakefield. Right. Well, um, it is uh, just then up uh, to me to say goodbye to you all and to remind you that uh, the AIIA is here and we are a membership organization. We exist um, in every state and territory capital. Uh, We have a branch office in every state and territory capital in Australia and we're open to the public. Uh, Go to internationalaffairs.org.au, sign up as a member and come along to our public events. We do, of course, hold numerous events in person and you'll get all of our webinar content uh, at the moment for free if you are a a member. Um, It's also my duty, of course, to thank our guests, um, Vice Admiral Timothy Barrett, Admiral uh, Murakawa Yutaka, uh, Professor Toshimi Nohara, uh, and Dr. Lauren Richardson. And of course, to thank um, our partners in this project, the Japan Foundation, um, as well as the Research Institute for Indo-Pacific Affairs um, and the Embassy of Japan. And to thank you as well for tuning in. It's been a wonderful session, but we now must